okay, don't forget your tracks and your missionaries, especially your missionaries. Man, last week, y'all did a good job on these tracks. I had to replace a lot of them to keep up the work. You know what the Bible says, I mean, what we say, don't you? Hell's hot, the Lord's coming ready or not. So we got to do what the Lord wants us to do quick because he might come this evening and we'll be happy about it. All right. The missionary for this week is Demontro Rod Rodrigo, right? Man, I'm good with these names. <laughs> if I had names like Bill Snow, you know you could just about work in place, couldn't you? That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Bill. All right, this time, let's all stand to our feet and grab a hymn on our way up. Turn all the way over to page 412. Onward, Christian Soldier. Yeah. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verse this morning. Page 412, first, second, and fourth verse.
love in Christ, the farmer family. I also have one more card. Thank you for everything. Your thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness and appreciation more than you know. Also says, we would like to thank our church family for all the many cards, prayers, and donations received during our time of loss. It is a very, very hard time for us, but your many thoughts and prayers will uh, help us get through it. Our dad was a very godly man that was in church every time the doors were open. So we know that he is in heaven watching down on us today. Thanks again for being a great church family to us. Love you all. Earl and Deborah Connor. Let's be sure to remember the Connor family and the farmers at this time. Amen? Amen. All right. Before we get to the announcements, we also, this morning you received a uh, miracle request for Revival 2021. Uh, these are just uh, uh, prayer cards that will be placed in the box over here at the altar. And I believe they're going to be prayed for each night uh, of Revival this year. So uh, if you want to see some miracles take place, amen? amen? Let's get our requests on there and put them in the box and we'll be sure to pray for them each night of Revival. And there's some extra cards in the back if you if you have more than one request. And it's a lot of things to pray for, amen? Amen. amen. All right, as you open up your bulletin, you see at the top it says, There's always something exciting going on at Timberlake Baptist Church. And be a part of every exciting opportunity. Uh, we see that tonight the news will be with us, uh, October 24th at 6 p.m. Uh, if you come back tonight, I promise you'll, be, you'll receive a blessing. I promise you that. Uh, Christmas play practice will be tomorrow, October 25th at 6.30 p.m. Also, a revival will be around us uh, next week, uh, October 31st. We'll be having Bobby Lee, uh, 11 o'clock and 6 p.m. services. And then we'll have Brother Scott Dean with us at 7 p.m. each evening, November 1st and November 2nd. Looking forward to all the Lord's going to do through that. Looking for soul saving life change. Amen? Amen. Amen. And also, Tuesday Bible study is on this week at 11 a.m. And please come join them. Uh, we will be And I promise that will be a blessing as well. All right, this time as the ushers make their way up to the uh, front to receive our offering, let's remember that our white envelopes in front of us are for our tithes and offering, and our brown envelopes are for our building fund. Can't wait to get on a new land, amen? Amen. amen? amen. All right, if you don't have cash or check, Brother Kim is back there at the back. He'll be glad to help you if you have a debit card, credit card. You can give that way as well. And also, if you're listening by way of Internet, you can give two ways. You can go to our website, www.strengthfortheday.com and click a secure link at the top, and also by way of mail. You can send it to P.O. Box 1004, Danville, Virginia, 24543. All right, at this time, we have Brother Stanford come and bless our offering this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for allowing us to live in a country where we can come and worship you freely. Uh, thank you for everything you do for us and all the continued blessings to this church. And I uh, just be with us today in the preacher and his sermon and bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
stay working. And I thought, that's how it's supposed to be. Amen? The parents teach the children, and the children teach their children, and that's how they serve God through the years. Amen? Amen. And uh, so it was a real blessing last night seeing that. I want to remind you that revival is just around the corner. It's next Sunday. And all the, you know, I got called, you know, Sean Horbett has a problem. Y'all praying for him? Yes. He, he almost called me a liar. But anyway, the youth department don't think that the adults can bring more visitors than they can. But us old folks is going to show them. Amen. Amen. Come on, old folks. Amen. And so we're looking forward to it. But they got their own thing going for visitors. But <clears throat> for the adults, the man and the woman who brings the most visitors can win an, a Hendrickson My Bible, I Bible, King James Version. It's got its own earphones, rechargeable battery, and you can carry it just about the size of a credit card. You can carry it with you anywhere you want to go. So let's bring those visitors out. Now the prayer cards, make sure you fill those out. They're extra back there if you need them. I believe in miracles, don't you? Amen. I've had a couple of miracles this year that the Lord's blessed me with. And this week, uh, they told Beverly she had a herniated disc, and it was going to be a bad surgery. They got in there, and there was a little cyst, took it out, and it's all over. Amen. See, God works miracles if you pray for them. Amen. Aren't you glad you prayed for her last Sunday? I almost messed up. I almost forgot. See, I'm a human being, too. But see, miracles are real, and they come when you pray. So get those requests, put them in that box up there. They'll be prayed for every day between now and the revival. And uh, Bible study on Tuesday, we're going to take time to pray for them because we believe a God can hear and answer prayer and work miracles. It's good to see you here this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter 27, verse 14. We've been talking about we need the courage of Christ. And we need that courage today. Psalms 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of what kind of courage? Good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You say, what's the difference between courage and good courage? Sometimes people have courage, but it's of and in themselves. And it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I'm here to tell you, courage in God works every time. Wait upon the Lord. And we talked last Sunday about courage in, the, in standing on the Word of God. Thank God for the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, standing on the Word. Number two, we talked about Sunday night, courage and soul winning in the world. My heart's broken when I see all the lost people in Danville. As I've been riding my car, I've been praying, Lord, show me how to reach this city, how to reach these people with the gospel. I don't want to make them church members. I don't want to make them good people. I want to see them come to Christ and get saved. Amen? Born again by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And to do that, we have to have courage to reach out to people. Because, see, people today will make you out to be a bully, intolerant, and selfish for sharing your gospel. Don't let them do that to you. And don't let them do that to you. If they're treating you that way, it's because they know they need to be saved. Amen? They're rejecting it. And they need the gospel. Don't be ugly to them. Just be gracious to them and give them the gospel. And to this morning, we're going to talk about courage and encouraging others along the way. Courage to encourage others along the way. It took courage for Jesus to go to the tombs and to raise Lazarus from the dead after all the discouragements of his disciples and the disdain of the religious leaders standing around just waiting for him to mess up and have a crack in his testimony so they could find it and exploit it because they did not want Jesus to be known as the Messiah. It's the very same way it is today. Things haven't changed. Things are no different. They're watching you and I trying to find a crack in our testimony so that they can dis disdain us and discourage people from listening to our gospel. That's the weapon of the enemy. But Christ's love for Martha and Mary was greater than the fear of his adversaries. We have to be people who love souls so much, love the brethren so much. We're not worried about what people say or what people do. We're going to be encouragers along the way. 
We're going to do everything we can to be a blessing to the lost and to the saved alike. Christ's desire was to be a blessing and encouragement to these two sisters. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto how many men? All men lost and saved, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Boy, the church ought to be good to each other. But you know today the churches are biting and devouring each other from within and without. We've got to stop that. That doesn't, that doesn't do a thing for the cause of Christ. Doesn't do anything for the gospel. We've got to love and encourage each other and lift each other up. Not doubt everything everybody says, Sean Horbett. <laughs> got to be encouragement, not a discouragement. 1 Peter 2, 1, 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in the obeying of the truth through the Spirit. Listen to this. If you obey the rules, obey the book, not to go to heaven but to be a servant, you're saved by grace and by the blood, not by works. Works are a result of being saved. Amen? Therefore, we'll serve him and live for him unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That means you're not using people for your own selfish motives, but you do what you do just because you love them, just because you care. I went to my sister-in-law's grandmother's funeral on Friday, and uh, my sister was watching her two grandbabies. And uh, I have grand dogs. She has grand babies. And they were out on the porch playing when I pulled up. Both of them come running to the car. And they just stood there and stared at me. And they just stood there, me and Crystal talk, and they just stared at me. And I kept talking, and Crystal kept talking, and Finally, Daddy got out the car, and he went into the house, and Wendy got in the car, and they're still staring. I reached above my visor, pulled out my money envelope, pulled two $5 bills out, and their eyes went, Phew. and they looked at me like, what are you fixing to do? They knew. I handed both of them a $5 bill, and I said, now, don't y'all spend this all in one spot. And the oldest boy says, I'll spread it around. I promise you I'll spread it around. <laughs> I'll spread it around. There was nothing I could get out of those two kids. I did it because I loved them. Amen? And I care for them. And uh, Ruby used to do that to us. But it was four of us, and she could only give us a dollar. But back then, a dollar was like $10 now. So, amen. so I was a little chintzy on them to only give them a five. Amen? But you know what? Ruby did that because she loved us. And then when Ruby got old, Ruby never paid for nothing when she was with me. If she had medicine to buy, I bought it for her. If she had food in the grocery store, I paid for it. She got mad at me one day. Can y'all believe Ruby got mad? She got mad at me. Don't let me do nothing. I said, I ain't going to either. I said, I owe you for all them dollars you gave me years ago. And I said, now I'm trying to do for you what you did for me. We don't do what we do to get. We do what we do because we love. Amen? Unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart. How? Fervently. Love each other. You don't let things bother you. You don't get mad at the least little thing. Hey, none of us are perfect. All of us get up on the wrong side of bed every day. That slid by you. I said we all get up on the wrong side of bed every day, don't we? We have our bad days. We've got to love each other despite that, despite our faults. Uh, uh, the love covers a multitude of sins. I want to share several thoughts about Jesus this morning and how he encouraged people along the way despite the persecution. Now, a, he, well, let's look at the will of Christ in John eleven seven. John chapter 11, verse 7. Then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go unto Judea. What's that word? Every word in the Bible is there for a purpose and a reason. So let's go there again. Knowing what had happened in Judea before and how the Judeans felt about Jesus now, he still felt the need to go back to Judea. They wanted to kill him. And eventually they did kill him. But he did not allow the fear of what they thought or what they could do stop him from the love in his heart of going back to Judea to be good to Mary and Martha. Did not allow it. 
The need was his love for these two sisters. The need was to follow the path and the will of God for his life. His will was to do the will of the Father who sent him. When are we going to start focusing not on the things around us, not the troubles and the heartaches about us, but when are we going to focus enough on the will of God not to be afraid to go ahead and do what God needs us to do? To be a, not be afraid of the circumstances of life. You see, John 6.38 says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. We've got to get to the place in our lives where we understand, first of all, there is a will of God for our lives personally. Each Christian, God has a perfect will for you. Secondly, it is planned so that only you can do it. And number three, if you don't, nobody else can. We have got to find these wills. The will, there's no such thing as the permissive will of God. I had a friend of mine say, I'm in the permissive will of God. I said, no, you're out of the will of God. Period. No permissive will of God. You're either in it or you're out of it. We don't like that because that makes us have to come back to him. It has to make us follow a narrow line of faithfulness and uh, faith in him. He said, I come to do the Father's will. That was the will of Christ, to do the Father's will. B, the worry of his constituents. Now, this is something I've had to learn over the years as a pastor. Because as a young man, I depended a lot on others for wisdom and guidance, and I have all my ministry. But you see, your constituents are the people around you. And sometimes they can be discouragers rather than encouragers. They can be hinderers instead of helpers. They can be halters instead of exalters. Look at verse 8 of John 11. And his disciples. These were the people he chose. He was teaching. He was leading. They said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and thou goest thither again? Let's put that in modern English. Hey, buddy, they didn't try to kill you once. They're going to try it again. They're going to try to kill you. You're still going to go? Jesus had courage. Peer pressure is one of the strongest pulls on our flesh in this physical world. And it's not just young people who have peer pressure. It's all ages that deal with peer pressure. It's here. It's the now. It's the immediate. The concern of the disciples was real. It was sincere. But it was wrong. It was wrong to be afraid to go out and go be a blessing to these two sisters who lost their brother. They loved Jesus, and they didn't want anything to happen to him. The difference between what Jesus uh, the difference between Jesus' thought pattern and the disciples' thought pattern was Jesus knew the will of God. I scratch my head a lot of times at the decisions Christians make, and I have to come to the conclusion the difference is they don't know the will of God. They do what they want to instead of what God wills to be done. And folks, we've got to make decisions according to the will of God, not how we feel or how we think. The Bible's clear. The difference in making a good decision and a disastrous decision is do you know the will of God for your life and are you pursuing it with every ounce of your being? The difference between living in worry and living in fear and living in the middle of the miracle world is knowing the perfect will of God. I want miracles, don't you? I like miracles. I, see God, I love seeing God do things I can't do and he does them for us for our faithfulness in him. Their fear was going to hinder them from doing the perfect will of God. Don't let your fears and phobias stop you from stepping out on the water, <coughs> stepping out in faith. Mark 3, 5 said, For whosoever shall do the will of the Father, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. Folks, God the Father is our Father. We are his family. And you ought to love him more than anything else on earth. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the changing of the way you think, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect what? Will of God. There's only one perfect, acceptable will of God in our lives. I told Sunday school this morning, I got bored on TV the other night doing this flipping thing. The new cable company, 8, October 1st, cut me 30 channels, and I got mad. 
But after Friday night, I'm probably glad because I'd have been wasting my time. Flip, 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 throw 30 more channels. So I saw on there, it said, the Dove Awards. I said, wow, that's gospel music. I think I'll turn on that and see what's on that. And when I hit it, there was the Isaacs. Boy, I like them Isaacs, amen. They sing good gospel music. I enjoy their music. They were singing their latest song, American Faces, and they was doing a good job, and they come off stage. I said, man, this is going to be good. I sit back in my chair, raise my legs up, and sit back and relax. Then the next group come on. There was women what looked like men, and men look what were like women. They had earrings where earrings weren't supposed to be. Some of them look like green-eyed monsters. I, I, I have never seen. I hit mute because I couldn't stand the, the doo-wop music they was doing. I hit mute, mute. I thought maybe this will pass by quick. And I thought to myself, what's the difference between this and MTV? I wouldn't know the difference if I took the mute off. Wouldn't know the difference. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Anybody can live like the world and call themselves Christians. But it takes a real Christian to live by this book. Say amen. And do God's will God's way. And not what makes other people comfortable. You see the reason they dress like that? And they act like that? And all these hill song churches is popping up everywhere? Is they're trying to make people feel comfortable. Well, you know, the last thing I remember, the Word of God brings conviction, not comfort. Then when you get saved, it brings what? Comfort. You see, the, cat, the, the cart is pulling the horse. Things are backwards today. We're not here to conform to this world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not to be like the rest of this world. We're to be different. Somebody said, Preacher, when are we going to get us a praise team? Never. That's what a choir's for. Preacher, when are you going to wear Bermuda shorts? Never. Preacher, I'll get you in a minute. Preacher, when are you going to wear a t-shirt in the pulpit? Never. I'm going to wear a tie and a coat. I even went out this week and bought me a new coat just to be, be stubborn and stuck in the old-fashioned ways. I got there and she said, we don't have none. I thought she was going to say, because I was so big, she says, they're all in the boat out in the ocean. We can't get them in. So I had to buy my coat, and they're going to ship it to me. I hope I get it before I die. <laughs> Amen? Hope I get it before I die. But let me tell you something. We're not to conform to the world. We're to conform to Christ and his will. And it's not the way of this world. And this world is not going to like you. We're never going to make the world like us. That's a foolish way to do things. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service as who pleasers? Men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as unto who? The Lord and not unto men. Doing the will of God. Hebrews 10, 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, but your courage, which have great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience. But after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You don't get the promise and then do the will of God, fellas, ladies. You do the will of God first, then you receive the promise. You can't live in sin and expect God to open the windows of heaven and bless you. Not going to happen. You got to obey him. In 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, where's Manny? I'm going to preach your message. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, what? Passes away. And the lust thereof passes away. But he that doeth the will of who? God. Abideth how long? Forever. Forever is a whole lot better than never. Forever is a whole lot better than never. And that's what I want to do, fulfill the will of God so that I can have others go with me to heaven. What? Forever. Forever. 
We've seen the will of Christ, the worry of his constituents. They're going to kill you, Jesus. But see the weariness of the cynic. Look at verse 16. Then said Sean Hubbard, I mean Thomas, which is called Didymus, and his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Boy, he was so optimistic. As the old saying goes, there's one in every bunch. Mr. Negativity, Mr. No Hope, Reverend Pessimism, hey, don't follow Jesus. He's headed into a death trap. His mind was made up. He was not on the same page as Jesus Christ. Not at all. It's easy to follow the cynic because it absolutely takes no courage to do nothing. It doesn't take any courage to do nothing. Just sit there and do nothing. The cynic has to be right. The cynic has to be the one that makes perfect sense. I've been in meetings where people said, this just don't make sense. God's will never make sense. Because it's God doing it, not a man. And men don't understand God's ways. Faith does not have a well-mapped out plan. There are no built-in guarantees. Faith is following God wherever he leads. I love that song. Wherever he leads, I'll go. That's what it takes. Hang on, bulldog forever. It's faithfulness to God, a faithful steward of the Lord. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Wherever he leads, I'll go. That's what we need to say this morning. Cynics never see a miracle. They are headed in the wrong direction to find miracles. Miracles are not that way, folks. Miracles are that way. Do you see where your preacher's pointing to that box over there? Miracles start with prayer, not skepticism. You've got to have prayer, trust in God, faith in God. So they want, they're headed the wrong. They'll never find a miracle on the road they're on. They're not walking in faith, following Jesus, love, trust, and patience. They walk in skepticism, criticism, and pessimism. When Ronald Reagan was president, he was an optimistic man. What we have in our government today is nothing optimistic at all. He went around telling us we were a city built on a hill with a light for the world. Now all they do is stand up there and fight and fuss in Richmond and in Washington because it's full of skeptics, cynics, and pessimists. Doubt, judgmentalism, hopelessness. That is the weariness of the cynic. After Thomas put his finger in the nail-pierced hands of Jesus, you never heard of him again on the pages of the Word of God, did you? He went off the map, never to be heard from again. You don't never hear us reading from the book of Thomas. It's not in there. He remained a cynic. He amounted to very little for God Almighty because of the awareness of his thoughts. Don't be Thomas. Don't be the cynic or the pessimist. Be like Jesus. Be the optimist with faith and no fear. The will of Christ. The will of his constituents. The weariness of the cynic. Now let's look at D. The wickedness of the council. Now we're going to go from looking inside the church to outside. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary. They were there too. The Jews, the unbelievers, the religious crowd, they were there trying to comfort Mary. Listen, you can comfort somebody with a bad message, but it's never going to bring comfort. Jehovah's Witnesses started mailing out letters. Throw them away. They're Job's comforters. They could all be named Zophar. You know, Bill, Dad, Little, Eliphaz, and Zophar. They were Job's comforters. And so far, so far, he said nothing. Hmm? And, the, and the Jehovah's Witnesses ain't said, if, if they're sending you a letter telling you you need to be a Jehovah's Witness, but ain't but 144,000 going to make it. I'm probably left out. How about y'all? 
You know, they don't know their Bible. They had too much pizza and buttermilk, maybe some uh, Jack Daniels with it before they went to bed one night and got up and had a vision the next morning. Misinterpreted the Word of God. They have no comfort. If only 144,000 are going to make it, and there's three, what is it, three billion in the world today? Am I right? Only four. It's three or four billion in the world, and only 144,000. I don't know, I already missed the boat. How about you? Ridiculous. My Bible says, for whosoever will may come. Say amen. Thank God for uh, Jesus and his comfort. He can heal the brokenhearted. Then it says, and had seen the things which Jesus did. They saw him work miracles and believed on him. Some of them got saved. But some of them went to their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And they gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees in a council and said, What do we for this man do with many miracles? Well, lo and behold, what's so bad with that? But that's what the world says about the church today. We're bad people. We're bigots. No, that's just the way they look at us. Because we stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The Bible's built to bring conviction, to show you you need a Savior. You're never going to see you need to be saved until you see yourself lost. Amen? And that's the key to the Word of God. Then it says, Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. The Jews, the religious crowd. You know what? We're looked down upon in this world, even by the religious crowd. Why? Because we stand on the Bible and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't change for their skepticism. We can't change for their persecution. Why? Because only one life shall soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ is going to last. And for whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life was cast where? In the lake of fire. That's hell, folks. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I want everybody to go to heaven. Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead despite the fact that these people were out to kill him. These disciples weren't wrong. They were trying to kill him. Verse 8 of John 11 says, His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone me, and goest thou thither again? Lord, you know they're out to get you. You know they're out to kill you. He had performed many miracles. He had resurrected many from the dead. And the Jews were living concerned about losing their following and their status. We're not here for following our status. We're here for souls to go to heaven. Amen? That's why we're here. Jesus wasn't there to build a following. He was there to encourage the brethren, save the lost. How long could they compare him to themselves? They couldn't. He was real, and they were pharisaical phonies. The philosophy of men is foolish. The power of God is miracle working and eternal. They were doing this. He was doing that. Say amen. They were doing this. He was doing that. He was working miracles. What are you doing today? This, or are you doing that? We need to be reaching out to the lost, reaching out and encouraging the brethren. The philosophy of men is foolish. The power of God's miracle working. It doesn't compare. It takes courage to stand against those who hate you because God's hand's on your life. They're just counterfeits, frauds. They're shameful and they're pretenders. It amazes me how many people they think their job in the church is to criticize everything everybody else is doing when the real reason they're only doing that is because they can't get anything done. They're too busy doing this and not doing that. I've learned if I stay busy, I ain't got time to criticize, fuss, and argue. There's too many people need to be saved. Too many people need to be encouraged. It takes courage to stand against those who hate you. Jesus' works were born of love, and their world, they were born of self-promotion and preservation. They just wanted to promote themselves and just get through this thing. I got news for you. I'm going to do more and get through this thing. I'm going to heaven by the hand of the Lord. All you had to do was look at the solutions to know their solutions were wicked and not righteous. Righteousness is the true characteristic of those who are following God. 
and not their own lust of the flesh. It's important what counsel you listen to. It's important what church you go to. It's important what the Bible you have in your lap. Don't mess with my mama. The King James Version birthed me into the family of God. Don't you mess with my mama. If it was good enough to birth me into the family of God, it's good enough to birth anybody. And you don't need to change the word of God to make it workable. It works on its own. Men will lead you astray. But the Lord Jesus Christ will always lead you in the way. Amen? In his book, The Yoke of Christ, Elton Trueblood quotes a letter from a schoolgirl who was probing the depths of her soul over this very question. And she wrote this. I've been thinking much this year about the importance of caring, of the passion of life. I've often realized that it takes real courage to care. Caring is dangerous. It leaves you open to hurt and even looking like a fool. And perhaps it's because they have been hurt so often that people are afraid to care. You can't die if you're not alive. And then who, who would you rather be, a stone or a living vessel? I have found many places in my own life where I kept a secret store of indifference as a sort of self-protection. This is a penetrating insight. A secret store of indifference. We're not to be indifferent. We're to care. We're not just to walk on by and not pay attention. We're to love people and to reach out to the lost. We're to care for those who are hurting. We're to care for those who are not even lovable. You see, to not care means you've stopped looking at the cross. That my nice song Diane's been singing all week. I had to go get my CD by Mark Bishop and listen to it some more this week. You can't look at him on the cross and say he didn't love you. And you can't look at that cross. And you can't stare at that cross and not love him and not love other people. Courage will come. Indifference will go. But we need some Christians who will make their mind up. I want to be a blessing to someone today. I want to be a blessing to someone today. That's got to be your prayer. If you're going to win the lost during this revival, if you're going to encourage the brethren during this revival, you have got to not be indifferent. You have got to care. You have got to care about the lost. You got to care about the brethren. So if you want revival to start, it's got to start this morning. Stand to your feet. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. You got to start this morning, Christian. We're going to have a verse of invitation in just a moment. Christians, you need to lead the way to come to this altar and kneel down and pray for miracles. Then, maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you don't know if you died right now and you go to heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'll not come to you and I'll not embarrass you. I'll not do anything in any such way, but I want to pray for you. There's nobody looking but me and God. How many of you raise your hand this morning and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to know. Would you slip your hand up and just say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, slip it down very quickly. I'm looking over the auditorium. If I don't see you, wave at me. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm concerned about my eternal soul. If you're here this morning, you're a Christian. You've got someone who's lost who needs to be saved. Someone backslidden who needs to come back to God. Maybe you've got a personal need in your family, finances. Maybe you have a spiritual need. Maybe there's some sin overwhelming you in your life. Revival starts right now. Father, take this invitation. Lord, speak to every heart. Lord, I pray that you'll take and reach. And Lord, help people come and realize they need to be a blessing today. Lord, reach down now, I pray, in Jesus' name. As King starts this invitation song, come on right now. If God spoke to you, come speak to him. He's waiting to hear from you more than you're waiting to speak to him. Come on right now. Gather around this altar.